I really, my whole mission for my company and the work that I do with parents is to really address that societal belief that we have. We start right from when they're born. No, you're going to have trouble with this one when she's a teen or, or, oh, just you wait. You think it's bad now. You think the terrible twos are bad. Just you wait until they're teen years. So we've all heard some version of this and we really prep our kids and our parents for this inevitable ripping apart of the family that in order to be an individual, in order to find out who you are, you have to rip apart from your family unit to what we call individuate. And I don't believe that's true. There are other societies where you're able to stay intact and not fight and not pull apart from your family of origin and grow to be a very successful adult human being. So I really believe that this is just something that we have to unlearn. And it's possible to unlearn. Nothing's perfect. They're still going to be teens and they're still going to want their way. But we don't have to end up in family therapy. We don't have to hate our parents and run out of the house and stay at your friend's house. And all the things that we end up doing when we feel that the only way to be an individual is to pull apart from our families. Thanks, Nicole, for joining me. I've been really excited to have this conversation for a little bit. We met at a Tony Robbins event and we had an initial talk. We found out that we're actually in from the same neck of the woods. Mm-hmm. For those that don't know you, bunch of, could you yeah. just give yourself a little bit of an introduction and let us know who you are? Sure. My name is Nicole McDonald, and I'm the founder of Leading with Love Parenting Revolution. And that is my company. And I really work on helping families to navigate the teen years really in a much more loving way, regaining the leadership role in their family, navigating the chaos and the eye rolling and being able to actually bring their families closer rather than those teen years, which are so treacherous. It's, I love what you just said there reestablishing a position of leadership. And so mm-hmm. that is something really you know, for feel good fathers we're navigating what it means. The traditional role was men were the head of the household men falls that's kind of like the traditional world, but we're in, especially for the past 20 years or so, we've been in this new world where that responsibility is split. So let's, I, I'd love to hear your perspective on, not necessarily on the split of the leadership, but mm-hmm. specifically what does, parent as leader. Let's talk about what parent as leader means uh, in that. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a really scary topic for parents and they get very confused. And I think it really has, I believe it really has led us to where we are, where we're almost afraid in our parenting role sometimes. Mm -hmm. And the, I hate to use the word power because it turns parents off, but bear with me, but there's a power shift, right? There's a power shift where because we're afraid, we don't really understand where our line is. We want a parent different than our parents did. We actually end up loving too much and being too lenient. You know how the pendulum swings one way to the other. And so I really take a focus of helping them reestablish that role of leadership in order to be more loving because Mm -hmm. it, love is not permissiveness. Love is not giving someone all they want. Or they, but love is showing up in a way that our kids need. Mm. And we get super confused with that. And so that is why I talk about our families almost like a business, right? And your business may be a failing business and we need to really meet and figure out how to turn it around and turn it into a profitable business that aligns with your values or is it a very successful business? We just need to do some tweaks. So that is, I got off on a little bit of a tangent, but that is really leadership in your family is so important. And we've lost that confidence in that role uh, often. You know, I, it, it, it makes complete sense that, especially when you're talking about the discipline side, because discipline is the word that none of us, none of mm. us 
taking that responsibility. I always think too that there's a very famous French commercial. It's the French content commercial. It's the kid that's running through the grocery store. Je vais les bonbons. It's like throwing candy. Because <laughs> dad's like, no, don't do that. And it's like the eye roll. And if you could cut out the last little bit that, that grows the condoms, I think that, that is the fear, right? If I was to really think about what is it that we're afraid of as parents, I think two things. Number one, that we completely break our kids, right? I think that's mm-hmm. like, if I think about, whenever I think about the word discipline and just calling my daughter into action and, and look, because my wife's initial she'll stop me because I'll go and I want to coach another kid. I'd be like, oh, you could do better. And then she's like, oh, <laughs> not your kid. I'm like, okay, 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 okay. <laughs> right? Stay in my box. And so that, that's kind of funny. But also from the other side where it's, I look at these parents and they're negotiating with the four-year-old. Mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. like, no, mm-hmm. no, you're in a mall. I, when I grew up, if I acted out, we immediately, we left the store, we left the restaurant, we had a whole conversation, maybe there was spanking, who knows what was going on, but it was a, a fundamentally different world. And it really breaks my heart to be walking around in any sort of open setting and the kids just bonkers. Now, I'm not talking about like young kids that just need to sleep or just need to eat. Like I'm talking about people that can reason, they're developing their brains, they're getting to that point, but they feel, but as you're saying, they feel like they're in power. The kid feels like, oh, I have control of mommy and daddy. I can have them do whatever they want. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to negotiate to hang out in the toy store or hang out at Target or go to the grocery mart. And it just, it's weird. It's weird to see it because it's such a departure from, Mm -hmm. I think, what definitely what I grew up with. So let's talk, let's talk about navigating that space, right? Yeah. Well, I think, and I think it also is, it's talking to the parent that's in that role. Like, how did I find myself here? And then it's embarrassing. Like everybody can see what's going on, but also we desensitize ourselves a little bit to it because it tends, it becomes our, our way of interacting. We have in a way, not in a way, we definitely have taught our kids that this is acceptable. And we didn't realize we were teaching them. It happens so slowly and so insidiously. You come home and you're so exhausted, you just let something go. You feel guilty that they had a really bad day, and so you let something go. You just know it's easier to clean the darn house yourself, so you just pick up after them. And these little things, they grow and grow. And what we're teaching them is that if you fuss, if you make me think that something's wrong in your life, if I'm too tired, if you get me the right way, you will get your way. And unfortunately, once kids realize that, because listen, they're really smart and they really know us. They know how to just get us. They read us like a book and they know where our weaknesses are. And it doesn't mean that we can never have a bad day at work or never allow these things to happen. It's just when you are starting to see this in your family, you have to think like, where are the little places that I'm letting this, letting things go so that this permissive behavior is happening? I love what you're saying. Let's talk about, can we take an example to to paint a a picture for Mm -hmm. our our father out there that's listening? What are we looking for? Mm -hmm. What? maybe some steps on, on how to change the behavior or steps on, cause it, I love this because it sounds a lot less of I'm changing my kid. And it sounds a lot yeah. more of I'm owning my behavior. I created mm-hmm. this result. So now I need to know how to fix it. Yeah, absolutely. I believe in, we can bend them to our will and we can, but it's so much more work and so much more effort and it's damaging your relationship rather to, than to really look at where you have the power and how you can show up differently. And so that is my complete model is to really start with the parents and then shift to the kids. So you really want to look at the places that, I'm trying to think of a specific example, but the places that you're starting to have explosions, you might not be at the point where you're having explosions, And I mean your kids explosions, right? Because that's going to tell you, give you a lot of information. And even if you think back over the last month, when has this happened to me? And why has it happened? What was going on? What did my kid want? Why did they feel that acting that way was okay? Mm -hmm. 
right? Because then we can really think about ways that you have allowed them or taught them to treat you that way. There's one thing that I got from Dr. Phil that I really, I'm not a big Dr. Phil fan, but he says, and it's spot on, we teach people how to treat us and that includes our kids. So if you can pause for a moment and think of the ways that you're teaching your kid how to treat you, it's mind blowing. You will start to see things in a different light. So once you're able to notice that, even if you don't, you can't find an example in the past, if you can move forward and the next time it happens, really be mindful of how did I teach her or him to treat me this way? And how are my actions once they act that way, encouraging it? Is there, is there um, a distinction, is there a distinction between when our child models behavior? So I had a recent example where my daughter reacted to me into a certain way. And I, I was like, that was really off. I was like, that, that felt really off. But then when I thought about it in a, in the moment, I was like, oh, she just modeled my wife. Okay. Right. And it was like, she just modeled my wife. She snapped at me. This thing happened. I was like, oh, that was really interesting. I corrected it in the moment. I said, hey, that's not how we talk. That's not how we treat people. It was very disrespectful to me. I don't want you to speak like that to me. And I don't want you to speak like that to, to my wife or to your mom. I said to her, your mom. <laughs> and then, and so then when I was talking with my wife about that later, I said, hey, I want you to be aware of this behavior because you do this. And I just saw her do this, our daughter, just something to take, think about. And I'm sure that there's probably a distinction. There's, if they're modeling behavior, I would imagine that it's probably like just change the behavior, improve yourself, do that. I think improve yourself, right? If you can see it or your significant other sees it in you and you guys have that ability to have that magnificent dialogue, but not all of us do. If you can, that is amazing and that is wonderful. What I like that you did is <clears throat> when our kids, ex ex I, I keep saying explode, but there's so many to that. But when our kids explode, we can't always address it in the moment. The reality is sometimes we're just trying to get through something. But I love the way that you went back and had that conversation because it's not that we have to always address a behavior in the moment, but we do have to always address a behavior. So that kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier. If you were exhausted and you let them get away with something, when you're not so exhausted or you're driving to school the next morning, you can have that, a dialogue that says, yesterday I just let this go, but it really is not an okay way to behave and it will blah, 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 whatever the lesson is you're trying to teach them. Does that dialogue, I imagine it does, that dialogue change, say, son versus daughter? don't think so. I think so. I don't think so. In general, we're teaching them to be good human beings and the foundations are the foundations and disrespect is never okay. And we always have to have that conversation. But I know that we had spoke a little bit before and there are some differences and some nuances between a man parenting a young daughter and parenting his son. So I think there are things that just inherently might be awkward for a dad or okay. hard, especially as they start to hit puberty and get older. It can be very, you know, I'm going to draw on my own. I have an amazing dad. I'm a daddy's girl. I have an amazing dad, but no one taught him how to parent a teenage girl and then a woman in her 20s. And it probably took us until I was in my 30s for us to really overcome that awkward hump. All of a sudden, I'm a woman and I have breasts and how does he hug me? And all of those things come up that are, they actually create a little bit of a pull apart a separation from fathers and daughters but it doesn't have to be that way I think it has it is something that you become aware of and educate yourself on and realize how important your role is with her and continue to have that conversation those conversations for my dad no one taught him that and so he's always an amazing man he's always there for me 
We just didn't know how to continue to have close conversations with me with all of this changes in my body, changes in my interests. Let's, this is great. So my daughter is a couple years from hitting puberty for the first time. And so I'm like, I'm not preoccupied, but I'm definitely thinking about these. Mm -hmm. And my wife and I, like my wife is in women's health. So she works in OBGYN's office. So a lot of these discussions, some of the more mechanical, we'll say some of the more mechanical (laughs) discussions will be handled by her. But Mm -hmm. I'm really occupied with what kind of relationship things can I teach her? How can I maintain the closest that we have? Those kind of elements. I would love it. And we can go back to your father's example. What did your father need to know when you were entering puberty? What did he need to know when you were in high school? What does he need to know when you leave the house for the first time, go to college, et cetera? What are the, these are milestones that are going to be super important as she's as she, the child, is becoming an adult and stepping into her own, what are the ways that we can, as fathers, just support? And what are the conversations we can have? And then, Mm -hmm. and maybe we can add in, like, what are the hurdles and pylons we should be avoiding? Yeah, yeah. I think the biggest thing for just my own dad, but also working with teen girls and their families for so long, and I raised three daughters myself, the biggest thing is no matter what your relationship is like with your daughter and some people are estranged from their daughters some people are divorced and the spouses aren't always don't always speak well of each other so there's a lot of obstacles particularly I think for dads to overcome that no matter what your relationship is you are the primary male relationship model in her life and how you show up is important. You might not always, I'm thinking of men who might not be so welcomed by their ex or even by their children. You're still playing a role, whether you're connecting and talking to her or not. And you're teaching her how men should treat her and will treat her. And so it's really important that you dialogue with her, that you keep some sort of role in her life so I don't know what else to say about that just that make sure you're trying to find a role in her life it might be to the point where you can only send a letter I would send a letter but if you are involved in her life just showing up you showing up I always love when my dad grabbed my hand my dad danced with me It's those little things like just at a wedding, my dad always came and danced with me. And when you do those little things, you might not always have the words. You might not always show up in the right way. Those little things communicate immensely to her that she's important. And by making her feel like she is important in your life, by grabbing her hand, maybe sitting down and watching a movie together, going for coffee or McDonald's or something it makes her a priority I love when dads take their daughters even if it's once or twice a year on a date I think that is so important for them to learn how to be treated by a man or a woman in their life and they learn that from their dads trying to think of some more examples but but this is I think the examples you've given are super great just the, mm-hmm. just the core idea of you are a model and just accepting that role. I think that is something it is, it's uncomfortable at first, but it doesn't imply romance, right? If, mm-hmm. if you're going to be a, a model for what she's looking for in a man as she's getting older, then what that means to me is character. What does the relationship look like? How should she be treated? If you're, she's going to be watching how I interact with, with the wife, how I interact, how I'm not divorced, but how he would interact with the ex-wife, right? He's going to be looking at all those different kinds of elements. That's the other way, right? The, how do you treat the wait staff? How do you treat the clerk at the thing? Are you telling jokes? Are you happy? Are people happy to see you? What kind of network do you have? All these different elements are 
pointing at, and especially when we go back in time, if, if we leave modern society and we go back, it's, you had a family unit and you were a part of it. You had a station in the tribe and everybody treated everybody relatively with respect and all that other kind of jazz. So it makes complete sense that having that time, taking that role, and this is where it really is like being a role model, right? Father is role model, mother is role model. Those things are very important. Thanks for sharing that. I think it's yeah. really yeah. empowering for people to hear. I so think that, it's also, oh, sorry. I just think it's also important not to get caught up on the words, right? right? It's our actions. You don't have to always know what to say. If she's had a bad day, you can simply sit on the end of her bed bring her a hot chocolate or, or something and just sit there. And if she doesn't say anything, it's okay to sit in silence, but it's our presence. So don't, I think oftentimes we allow our fear to stop us from taking that extra step. So don't be afraid you don't know the words to say. Your simple presence is enough. And it's also, there tends to be, and some of my women might get mad at me, but that there there's just something about your dad. There's a safety usually associated with him. There's a, 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 that male presence that's associated with him. So just your presence there and her knowing that you can sit there in that silence or recognize that she's having a bad day is very reassuring for her. Sounds, everything that you're saying, if I'm looking at it from a different perspective, is it, this really sounds like, how do you create a confident young woman that, that knows what to look for. And so to me, it seems like it's super critical that you know what you stand for. You have to know your values. You have to know who it is that you are in society, right? None of these slouch folks yeah. that, that are just reacting to the world and just kind of a victim of every, everything, right? There's this, there's this responsibility. I'm sure that it applies. I'm sure it applies equally to mothers out there because they have just as much responsibility on their shoulders as he does as a father. So that sounds really great. Okay. Yeah. So let's go back to, let's do the dreaded disrespect, right? The, I remember when I was, when we had really, when my daughter was very young, I, I turned to my wife and I said, look, because they were super young and they were starting to bicker. Like my daughter was really young, like before four years old, and they were starting to bicker at each other. And you know, I said to my wife, Aaron, I was like, you know, we got to solve this. You guys yeah. have to have a great relationship because, and I, I, I like the way that I expressed it may, may or may not have been correct, but I said, I don't want my house to be this chaotic when mm -hmm. it was older. And the way, if this is the way you guys have your relationship, we're going to have to figure something out because I don't need to be the intermediary. I shouldn't yeah. have to stand in between you two. You guys love each other and you just need to figure out how to talk. So let's go back to that disrespect, right? They're acting out. So we have this really great model of how to be, how to show, right? Let's talk about a couple of different avenues. Let's say, let's do a common thing that, that I hear is that when they hit high school, when they become teenagers, they have to go out on their own and figure things out, figure out where they stand in the world. That's, it's a, common knowledge. I don't know if I really agree with it. What's your take on that? I really, my whole mission for my company and the work that I do with parents is to really address that societal belief that we have. We start right from when they're born. No, you're going to have trouble with this one when she's a teen or, or, oh, just you wait. You think it's bad now. You think the terrible twos are bad. Just you wait until they're teen years. So we've all heard some version of this and we really prep our kids and our parents for this inevitable ripping apart of the family that in order to be an individual, in order to find out who you are, you have to rip apart from your family unit to what we call individuate. And I don't believe that's true. There are other societies where you're able to stay intact and not fight and not pull apart from your family of origin and grow to be a very successful adult human being. So I really believe that this is just something that we have to unlearn and it's possible to unlearn. Nothing's perfect. They're still gonna be teens and they're still gonna want their way, but we don't have to end up in family therapy. We don't have to hate our parents and run out of the house and 
stay at your friend's house and all the things that we end up doing when we feel that the only way to be an individual is to pull apart from our families. What should or shouldn't we do to, to facilitate that? Because as you were talking to me, I, I just kept reflecting on, thanks, Hollywood. I just, I just mm -hmm. like every, everything that I see, I remember like even yeah. Disney Channel shows are just like really unhealthy family units. Just, just not functional, not really working very well. But it, it feels like the odds are stacked against us. What can we do? They are stacked against us. They are, you have to be honest and own it. It takes a lot of work. It's a lot easier to just get in and have the fight and not put the work into directing your family. And think about it again, I go back to the business model. Think about your family and your family meetings as business meetings. You're the leader, you're in charge. How are you gonna direct that meeting? How are you gonna have your staff show up? And it can initially sound really cold, Oh, I don't want my family to be a business, but it is. It's the best, most important business you're creating in your life. And you have a legacy that a business that, that becomes your legacy in the world. So it really is something that you can take direction and be intentional with. And that's what we were talking about, the leadership and the leadership role and strengthening your role as a parent. So what can we do to not end up in that situation. The conversations that we were talking about, the conversation where you're dialoguing with your kids, you're you, becoming clear. Let me back up a minute because first step is really becoming clear on what your values are. And whoever's listening, it can be as simple as sitting down with a cup of coffee and a pen and paper and what are your values? What is important to you? Is it love? Is it connection? Is it success? What are your values that are, are most important to you? And then I would go a step further and it's almost like mindset work. And I would decide what you want your family to look like. What does that perfect vision look like? Because if you don't have clarity on it, you're not going to be able to lead the people, the little people under you in that direction. And to be clear, because this is to clarify both points one and two, these can be, there, there's no judgment. These can be whatever you want them to be. Mm -hmm. So if, if you're, if you're part of a military family and your parents are estranged for X months of the year, then mm -hmm. it works just as well for them as it does if you're in a divorce or a split household, as it does if you're with your, your you said origin family, that mm -hmm. you have your natural born mother and, and father in, under the same roof, all of this works. So yeah identifying what your values are, and then also identifying what your family, what you want your family to look like. Okay, right. great. Because once you're clear with that, you will show up in alignment with that. And mm. it's not something that you do once and you never review. You have to regroup. And I think you have to regroup in different stages that they have, because the way you parent your four-year-old is not going to be how you parent your eight-year-old or your 16-year-old, because they have, you have to elevate and evolve as a parent, but they have different needs as well. And it will become apparent to you. If you, if you are clear on your direction, if you are clear on your values, you will feel that misalignment and you will say, okay, I got to regroup. I, I got to think about this. The dialogue is super important because you're going to be dialoguing about your values about you're almost like training them, right? What you want them to grow up to be, their values that you want them to have. I, I was just gonna share a really funny story, probably a little inappropriate, but I had girls. And so you bring girl, little girls to New York City and this was gosh, back in the early nineties. And there are pictures of women in their underwear all over Times Square. And so that's not what I want my daughter to be doing. And so I point out, you know, she, there's, maybe she doesn't have a lot of respect for herself. Keep her clothes on, positive confidence. You don't have to be naked to be sexy, all those kind of things. And then Harry Potter books were out and we were at the pool and my young girl said to me, hey mom, I want, that's the book I want, that girl over there, she's reading it. I said, what girl? 
And she said, the one that has no respect for herself because she was in a bikini reading a Harry Potter book. <laughs> and so that backfired on me a little bit. And I guess I shared that because I, you do the best you can and then you realize, oh, maybe we're going a little too far in one direction. And then you have to change that message. I really like the opportunity that you had there. And it's something that is completely changed for today. It, when you were traveling before, you were saying the 90s, right? So that's, yeah. we barely had internet there. Yes. Netscape Navigator, stuff like that, it just, it just wasn't real. I'm really, and so I love that part. Yes, the good story, very funny. <laughs> I get it, right? The self-respect and stuff like that. But I think when I think about it today, I'm thinking about all the studies that we have of the, especially for daughters, right? The self-worth that goes down once they get on social media because everything's yeah. there. We know that bullying doesn't stop. Like bullying in the real world stops when you leave school or like when you get home, but online it, I'm hearing now that like high school kids are staying up till two, three, four in the morning, just following other kids on social media and hoping they get likes and reactions to whatever they put up there. My background is in video game design. And, and so I have some understanding of the perils of, of online gaming spaces. And one of the things that I told my daughter when she was really young was that she was a guardian, right? She's a custodian of the household, right? So don't let just anybody in the same way you wouldn't let anybody into the front door right? Don't let anybody into your friends. Don't just accept friend requests. Don't just do this. Like make sure you know the person, stuff like that. But I was intentional about that because I wanted to create a situation where she was empowered. She could make a decision by herself. And then she learned a good life lesson, which is just random people on, you don't know who the random person is online. Yeah. Yeah. So how do we combine, right? What do we do today? Given that once they get on Instagram, they have access to everything on Instagram, including all the soft porn that's on there, right? Yeah. What do we do? Yeah. What do we do once they get, once you get online, it's like, you, you can find whatever you want really quickly. Mm -hmm. And, and definitely for young people, they're just, they're figuring out who they are. Yeah. How do yeah. we, do we preempt these discussions? I'd love to hear your take. I think we do. We absolutely do. You have to have ongoing discussions with them about internet safety, about what they see. But that goes back, it struck me, as you said, the teens are up till two in the morning checking their lives. And more than that, they feel they need to be on call in case one of their friends needs them. And then they're up all night in some sort of drama or maybe even like a suicidal ideation and stuff that they just can't really handle at their age. But that goes back to parents and having, not having the strength in their parenting role or the confidence in their parenting role. Because all of that falls under your parenting purview. And this is a very, can be a very unpopular point of view that I have, but the reality is it doesn't matter who bought that phone. It doesn't matter what the situation is. That child's in your house and you're responsible for their safety. And you cannot possibly parent somebody if you have zero idea about what they're doing. So if your child is alone with their phone, with access to the internet and predators and all the horrible stuff that is going on in, in the internet, we have an obligation to protect them. And we have an obligation to teach them how to use it. And if they don't use it well, we need to use our parenting techniques, our discipline, until they're in, at a level that they're able to be trustworthy with that, that technology. But trustworthy can go, we're talking about terrible things, but trustworthiness can be, I'm able to turn it off and go to bed on time. But trustworthiness can be, I'm able to use the internet and not bully other people. Trustworthiness can be, I am being bullied and I will get help or at least communicate with my parents about it because they're, as parents, you're gifting them this device and that's all responsibility with it. And so that constant dialogue and understanding what your role is in, in parenting them through that is really important and it's really gotten lost. We really feel in an attempt to really love them and give them everything we possibly can, we leave them in pretty dangerous situations and we don't realize it. I've often said to 
one of my memes that I put up in, in my groups is you wouldn't really take your son or daughter down to the worst inner city neighborhood, drop them off at 9.30 p.m. and say, hey, good luck. I know that you'll just be fine. I'll be back at six and pick them up again. You would never do that. But isn't there a possibility that you might be doing that if you go to bed, leave them with their phone and don't see them again till six o'clock? You don't know who they're, who, who's, who, who they're encountering or what they're doing. Yeah. And I think that because of the way that young people work, I think the vast majority of the damage that's going to be done is probably from, from their peers. It's probably yeah. not going to be from some stranger or predator. It's just going to be somebody makes a passing comment. They don't have that capability of dealing with it. They don't have the mental right. model to, or the emotional intelligence to understand what's going on. Man, that's, that's a lot to think about. This is crazy. <laughs> that's a lot to think about. What a crazy world. Um, I, know. I know. Let's, uh, let's kind of go back to a little bit more of the coaching parenting thing. So we've got that uh, we're new to the conversation, right? We have an older, this is our scenario that we have an older child and they're teenagers. Now they're disrespectful. Okay. They're being disrespectful. How do we, and we haven't done any of the work. Yeah. What, what do we do? What's our, what do we do? That's a tricky question because it's very individual to each family because disrespect is not a, it's a vague term. What's okay. disrespectful to me is not disrespectful to somebody else. So you really have to be clear on what is disrespectful. What are your expectations in your family and begin to talk about that. When I deal with a family who is at that point and hasn't put the work in, I usually don't tell them to get off the phone with me and start like throwing discipline around and putting the hammer down because it's just going to cause further explosion. If you're at that point, you've probably invested a certain amount of time in avoiding explosions because that's where our parenting journey goes. We just want to keep the peace. We don't want to address anything that's going to cause an explosion. And so we end up really allowing things to happen. So at that point, I would say you really need to get clear on what you want and start having dialogues about it. Start being very clear about what your expectations are because we, this is another entire unit actually in my coaching program is on expectations. We think that our families, we think we have expectations and we think our families know what our expectations are but they don't, they're not mind readers. So unless you're super clear in explaining to your family what the expectations are, and also I believe in inviting them in, mm -hmm. because if you go and you just give all these rules and expectations, you're really just shaking your finger at them and your teen is going to shut down. I believe in really a process of changing how you are showing up, educating yourself on what you really want and where you're clear and where you're not. And then inviting your family in because you don't want more conflict. Like my goal is not to have you just be the police in your family, but it's about changing the direction. And if you do it a step-by-step -step where you're understanding and exploring, and then you invite them into expectations and you ask them what their expectations are, and you guys come up with consequences together, you're, it's so much easier to come out of that place that you're describing where we gotta, we gotta hang out here a little bit. Cause you said something that was really great. So you said having the conversation, but also coming up with consequences. This is, this is really interesting to me because now it's shared values, right? You're actually getting to the point where you're communicating what you value, inviting in for some shared value discussion, but let's hang out here a little bit. So what does this conversation look like? How do we facilitate it being healthy? Okay. So again, this is usually an entire unit that I'm doing in 15 minutes, but it also is again, and I'm going to say, I, I want to repeat that it, I don't have my parents that I work with do this until they've done their own self work. They right. understand their communication styles. They understand their kids' communication styles, and they've shown up differently for a few weeks so that the kids understand that mom and dad aren't faking it to get right. their way because they're teens and they will pick up on that. 
Yeah, lead, so, leading from the front. Yeah, leading from the yeah, front. You got to lead yeah. from the front until they get it. I go back to my business analogy all the time. You set up the room. What does the room look like? Where are you going to stand? I believe that sitting around a kitchen table or a table where everyone's equally can see each other and is at, and there's no power difference because you're inviting your kids in to talk. So if you're standing up or you're walking around, it, it's going to shut them down. I also recommend that you have them bring three of their own expectations that they'd like to see in the family. And this scares the heck out of parents, but it's very important because again, you're trying to do it without conflict and you're trying to instill certain values. So if you're inviting them to bring their expectations, you are teaching them that they're valuable. You're teaching them they're a part of the process. You're teaching them that their voice matters. You're teaching them that they can advocate for themselves and they can navigate difficult conversations. So it's really a valuable tool to use. Then you don't get upset when they bring you some absolutely asinine expectation that makes no sense. And you prepare yourself for it because you've already thought of the direction that you want this conversation to go. I also talk to parents about padding their list. So you have some things that maybe no longer serve your family, but they were expectations of yours. And a lot of times parents will say, well, that's manipulative. Yes, it is. But we are directing the conversation. And if you went to your boss for and wanting to negotiate something, you would know what your line was. You would know what you're willing to give up and what you're not. So if you pad your list, you are having a dialogue with your team and you are willing to give stuff up. So it looks like you're really willing to compromise. Is there a world where this is, where this discussion can be framed more as a non-zero sum game? Because I think one of the things that we're taught, let me take a step back. A lot of times we think of what parenting's in authority, right? It's like the might wakes right. I'm the parent, I'm the adult here. This is the way that we're going to do it. And I think taking the step towards the compromise and, and towards the collaboration, I think is really healthy. But even then it sounds a lot of it when you're, if you're pre-padding your list of things to get rid of, it sounds like, oh, you're already recognizing that somebody's going to say, oh, I don't like this value. And you can say, well, that one's not negotiable. We can get rid of these other ones that are preceded in that way. And I totally get the negotiation tactic, but I'm just kind of curious, is there a space where this becomes non-zero sum, where everybody's winning? Is, is it even, is it practical? Is it practical to have those expectations? It is. I, and it does work. It works very successfully. I actually call it like it's the constitution. It's a living document, living, breathing document. Mm -hmm. So you're going to really, it's going to become part of your family, your family culture where you you're reevaluating your, your expectations. And I want to go back because you said I'm the parent and what I say goes, I'm not opposed to that either. There is a time and a place where you're the parent and what you say goes and end right. of story. I, I don't want anyone to be afraid to do that either, but we're trying to the pendulum swung one way, it swung the other. We're trying to find some balance in the middle. And when you're always that kind of parent where it's my way and, and, or it's the highway, you end up creating distance. When you are too loving and too giving and too forgiving, you're actually still creating distance. It's that balance in the middle where you are engaging them, teaching them, leading them, but also setting limits that are firm, especially around safety stuff. It sounds it sounds a lot like a uh, rough play. Dads get a lot of a lot of bad rap for rough play with their kids. And by rough play, let's be real, we're talking about like light wrestling and stuff like that, rolling around doing all that kind of stuff. But when, whenever I've done any research into it, it really helps the child develop physical boundaries. It helps them understand bodies and relations. It teaches them fairness. Having we have some dogs and learning about how dogs work. It's if two dogs are playing and one dog gets too rough with another so one puppy let's do that so one puppy gets a little bit too rough with another puppy and the other puppy yelps 
basically the mom will soft, like the mom or the father will softly growl, will take the hurting puppy out of the equation, softly growl at it and just be like, hey, you went a bit too far. So the rough play is this really great tool to learn limits and boundaries. It sounds like with this exercise that what we're layering on is more like the intellectual and emotional side of the same boundary development. It's yeah. really, it's remarkable to me that we're okay with the intellectual and the emotional boundary sets, but we're less okay with the physical boundary sets, which I think is probably even more critical. Yeah. I just feel like it's so important to have all of these pieces, right? And we tend to demonize one thing or another, and depending on where we are societally and our growth and our evolution, but there are just so much value to the way that men show up in a relationship, the way that women show up in a relationship. And to leave any piece of that out is to do a disservice to our kids and to society. Yeah, I agree with you. I'd love to, I'd love to hear your take on leadership. I guess let's talk about leadership from the father and leadership from the mother as well. And I'd like to, when we're talking about it, think about the contribution of one parent to the other. And so what are some, in the interest of, of feeling great, in the interest of having great kids that have really strong role models and stuff like that that mm-hmm. they're learning from, let's, I think leadership is a great, it's a commendable quality, right? Mm-hmm. It's something that you, you can really young children that have that and have the practice in it and, and then good role models can really go far in life. And we all want our kids to thrive and, and prosper. So let's talk about leadership for the mom. What does that look like? I don't know. It's a loaded question there, <laughs> but it goes back to, I think the question about discipline and not discipline, I'm sorry, disrespect because it's different for every family, right? So it's hard to say what that role would be because you have so many different dynamics. You have two working parents, you have one working parent. Now with the pandemic, historic numbers of women are not returned to the workforce. You have more of a traditional kind of role where, so it's hard to say, I think I, would I, guess the, the- I guess the question would be there is that, so we're talking about traditional role. Mm-hmm. When I hear traditional role, I don't hear lack of leadership. Yeah. If let's go full traditional here, he's mm-hmm. leaving the house because mm-hmm. he's the primary breadwinner. She's yeah. staying home, building up the family. She's mm-hmm. the matriarch. He's the patriarch. Okay, yeah. great, cool, neat. She's spending more time with the children. So leadership is, it's more critical, I think, for her role, just from the Mm -hmm. sheer amount of time that that she's spending with the child. So like, how does that look healthy? Given the range of a person's capability at leadership, maybe it's a better question of how do they support one another? How do the Mm -hmm. parents in this Mm -hmm. environment support one another as we're sliding back into the traditional roles? I think absolutely the dialogue and listen, there's a lot of talking that we're talking about here and who's got time for all this talking, but it's really important that you find time for it because you're, you're planning together. And so what does your support of each other look like? I think that's super important that you understand what each other needs. So I know that we used to tap out a lot. Like I'd be losing my mind and not able to do anything more. And so we'd tap out and he would step in. And so that was very beneficial or vice versa. You know each other, you hear that change in tone and voice and oh, he's about to lose it. And so she steps in for him or, or whatever it happens to be. I think that is super important to learn how to do that in a way that doesn't undermine the other person because that is a delicate dance that parents have to do. You don't want to make either of the, your, either one of your partners appear weak or less than in front of the kids. You're a united front. So if you disagree with something, you talk about it behind closed doors, even though the kids can probably hear. 
you do the best that you can to support each other and iron those things out. What are the common, what are the common sentences and ways of being about disrespect one parent to the other that you hear? What are some of the disrespectful things that I hear? Yeah, we were talking about like the undermining elements, right? Whenever I think about guy-girl relationships, I always think about that horrible sitcom, King of Queens. Mm-hmm. It's like, look, if your idea of manhood is a dude that's just sitting there that's everybody else's punching bag, I'm not interested, mm-hmm. right? That's mm-hmm. not who we are. The same token, it's like any other version where she's nothing but a punching bag for him. I'm not interested yeah. in that. Yeah. Like, I don't, th- I don't yeah. think, and realistically, I don't think anybody is because I don't think mm-hmm. anybody comes into being a parent or comes into a spouse or comes into a romantic relationship and says, I really want a doormat. That's what I want. I want somebody right. that I don't respect, that yeah. uh, that I don't love, that I can just walk all over. Nobody wants yeah. that. Everybody wants some semblance of equal, mm-hmm. equal but different. So what are the common ways that we see, that you see that can be unintentionally undermining? I see oftentimes we will make like, cutesy remarks that aren't really so nice like all right let's go mom's a little crazy right now or dad's being his grumpy self and so yes we're trying to de-escalate a situation or explain away our uncomfortability but we are labeling that other person as crazy or grumpy or we need to get away from them instead of just hey guys let's go have some ice cream or hey let's go watch a movie or something let's go get on our homework and so there's those subtleties those little comments that we might make what i find in divorced families a lot and it blows my mind how much people do this and how much kids fall for it Mm. but parents will preface something like i don't mean to talk bad about your dad or i don't mean to talk bad about your mom but you know how blah, 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 blah. That if you are saying that, anyone listening to my voice right now, stop. (laughs) Because there's nothing good that comes after that statement. And it somehow, I've seen it backfire on divorced parents because once the kids get old enough to realize, oh, but they're still talking bad about my dad. And like my dad now and so all along we've been saying this and it really can backfire on you as the kids get older that's that one's really interesting i think that is a to me i'll, I'll be blunt i don't mind saying this because i i really feel that relationships are, are super work one of the one of the most important roles and i I'm assuming a couple of things over the statement, but one of the most important roles as a father is husband, right? That's just a period. Like the most important relationship you have is, is with your wife. She's with you far longer than your kids are in your house. Now we always, and so there's a couple of different idioms that go with having kids and, and stuff like that, but that's a 20 year career. It's a full life career, but really it's like the 20 year job versus hopefully what ends up being 30, 40, 50, 60 years together with your wife. So it really does surprise me with that. It it feels very, what I've seen and perceived, and most of this I get from Hollywood because I don't like to associate people with people that have these kind of things, but is that the casual disrespect? It's just very cowardly rather than just going to that person and saying, oh, I have an issue when we do this, or, hey, we're fretting a lot around the kitchen table. Let's let's work it out. We don't want to present this front forward. To then basically tribalize your house. Like, who's on my team? Who's on their team? And then really create that conflict. It feels very soap opera. It feels terrible. It feels very like days of our lives. <laughs> I'm just saying, you know. But a lot of times we don't even realize we're doing it. In, yeah. in defense of those people who are doing it, it's no, no disagreement at all. It's completely tearing apart your relationship. It's completely setting your kids up for problems. But we oftentimes, unless we do a lot of work on ourselves, don't see the generational stuff we've been passed down. So our parents might have behaved that way. And it might've just been a joke. And it was just how they interacted. We almost loved it about them. 
But now, as we're playing out 30 years later in today's world, we're seeing how that was disrespectful. So we didn't even realize it. And it just takes me back to something you said in the beginning of our talk. We talked about like chaos in the home and especially mothers and daughters are famous for it. But you get there and you don't realize you've gotten there. It's this small step upon step. So I always say, I'm not here to judge. Nothing about what we're doing here is judging. If you're realizing this, it doesn't matter how you got here. It doesn't matter what happened before this moment. Right now, and you recognize. And so to take the steps to move forward, to, to create change. Choice about it, right? What's that? That's the, you have choice about it. Like if, if you're at the point of awareness where you, if, if you're listening to this conversation, you want to get better. You want to have a better family life. You want to be a better father, husband. If you're getting to that point and you're aware of it, because that's actually one of the big themes that I heard in, in all of these different tactics and everything we've been talking about is really the first step is just not reacting in the moment, not coming up with a plan, not going back down to the bunker and coming forward with the military plan, the, the plan of attack against whatever it is going on. It's just to sit in the moment and just watch. What am I doing? What are they doing? And what you just added, what did my parents do that I've inherited? What did, and then, so not only are we doing that, because the, one of the great truths about all of us that our parents that we were all kids, right, yeah. is that we have to navigate that complexity for ourselves, but then we also have to navigate it for our spouse or the partner in, in the child raising. And then we also have to, and effectively, what we've really been talking about is being super intentional about how we're navigating that for our kids. How are, what do we want them to take away? I think that's such a, it's such a critical, powerful moment, right? I think for most people to realize that, oh, I saw something. Why did I do that? Oh, I saw that when I was three. Or my grandma used to say that about, my dad or such and such used to say that about this other person or my cousin in this relationship. Like it's all these things that we get from family that is unintentional, unconscious, right? And once we're aware of it, we can make a different choice. I think that's, I think that's really, I'm loving that. I'm loving that this is what, what we're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. I think our job is just to do better than our parents did, right? There's no such thing as parenting perfectly. And there shouldn't be, right? Because we would just be passing on a sense of unworthiness because perfection's unattainable. So we just do the best that we can. We catch ourselves when we're messing up. We gather information. We get help from experts like you or me. And you do the best you can with what you've got. Relationships and families are super, super hard, but they're definitely worth it. 100%. 100%. All right. So I got it. I'm really curious about this. What was the thing that was the most surprising to you about being a mom? What was most of the thing? Something that you didn't really expect? Oh, I need a moment to think about that. The most important, the most surprising thing about being a mom, how much fun it would be which is crazy because I've had those crying on the floor moments that every parent has had. I've had the moments that I thought that I completely screwed up my kids and I'd never get them back. And we all have, you go through every single emotion, whether you're a parenting expert or a parenting newbie. The, the, all of our experiences are universal. They just feel really lonely and like that we're the only ones. But fun because I, enjoy and embrace every moment not a, no every moment every stage every moment you can't possibly embrace and enjoy but every stage brought its own amazingness what's what's some piece of advice that you were offered on being a parent that's been meaningful and impactful that your job is never going to end which is interesting because it doesn't, my daughters are in their thirties and twenties and, and my job doesn't end. So prepare for it. It just morphs. So we don't ever really lose them, I guess is the good stuff there because it's just, 
you just have a different role, that's all. Something that you would tell new potential parents, new potential fathers, new potential mothers about the journey. What's a piece of advice that you would impart to them? I would say create your support network because you're going to need it for the good times and the bad. And there's no such thing as a perfect parent. So don't waste your time. Trying there to is such that. thing as a perfect you. Nicole, what mm -hmm. do you want to be known for? What do I want to be known for? I would like to be known for the person that did her best to help families break and change the belief that we have in our culture that you need to rip apart from your family in order to be an individual. I believe with my whole being that we can do it and stay intact as a family and it will create a better society and better human beings if we're able to do that. So if folks wanted to get involved with you or learn more about you, where would they go? So I will give you the link to all of my stuff, but mm -hmm. my website is leadingwithlove.com and it's leading W love. So with is abbreviated. I am on Facebook, Moms mm -hmm. Raising Confident Teen Daughters. And I am on Instagram. So they can reach out to me there. And I look forward to it. I love helping in any way that I possibly can. I believe I've been put on this earth to help families connect and to help this next level of, or generation of young women be the best that they can. I have no doubt. I have no doubt. I'm looking forward to watching you grow and to hearing you on more platforms. Nicole, thanks so much. Thank you. It's been fun. Awesome. Hey, feel good fathers, hit that like button to let YouTube know that you liked this video. Comment below with your thoughts and reactions to this interview. I really want to hear what you have to say. Now, as a personal brand strategist, I hear all the time about coaches, trainers, speakers, and authors doing the right thing, but at the wrong time. We specialize in helping brand builders have more impact more credibility and clarity, and developing an overall brand strategy. When you work with Brand Builders Group, we'll help you do the right thing at the right time. Request a free brand call below. There's a link in the description. And don't forget to subscribe. You'll get updates when the new episodes are launched, and it really helps out the community and the channel. We'll see you next time.